Welcome to our next uh, installment of What Now? Uh, today we're joined by a good friend and mentor, an amazing man, uh, Ronnie Lessam. Uh, Ronnie, you're originally from uh, Zimbabwe, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, living in, in London or living in England, as Anika is as well, I'm in Edmonton. And uh, we wanted to explore with you some of your amazing work over your lifetime, uh, what you see now in this situation and what I would, what some of us think is an economic pandemic as much as uh, the, you know, the virus having us, having put the whole world on pause, it seems. Uh, I remember reading one of your seminal papers, which we, we both have a similar background starting off in accounting and we left, we left that world a long time ago, but it comes back to haunt us. And I think the discussions we've had about um, the possibility of a new system of measurement of accounting uh, through your, your notion of the four worlds, I think it's very compelling. And, and that's kind of the spirit of what this show is about is talking about, you know, we can, we can go and retrace the past and say all well, the things that we could have and should have, should have done. But the question is, what do we do now? Um, what do we do going forward once this economic crisis has passed? Uh, and is this really an opportunity for some bold actions and, um, and some wisdom? Really, wisdom is what we need now, I think, and calm. So over to you, Nika. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and welcome, Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie is not just my partner in crime, <laughs> as in, in business, but also he's my teacher, mentor, and very good friend as well. Uh, because through him, I was also awakened to the, the concept of the integral and the integral consciousness, and especially um, operating in four worlds, which is like coming full circle. So Ronnie, we'll, over to you. And we would like to, you to start with maybe just giving a little taster about what the four worlds theory is mm -hmm. and how do we apply it to um, okay. everything. <laughs> Thanks, Anika and Mark. And I, I should start by saying that the how to apply it is for me absolutely critical because I have no interest in theories just for their own sake unless they can be actualized and transform our sorry world as we see it at the moment, albeit drawing on the richness of the world and in the way the two of you represent for me two key, key elements of that richness, the easternness that you carry, Anika, through your own Pakistani, Sufi, uh, Eastern context, and I'll come back to what I mean by the West, Mark, because I think there's a particular West which the world hasn't recognized, which I believe that you embody, and part of my life story has always been to find ways in which, yes, there are different philosophies, concepts, ideas there out in the world, but they're always embodied in particular people, then unless you actually work closely with those people, then those philosophies remain disembodied. So when I lived my early life in Zimbabwe, it was called Rhodesia at the time, I lived in that unbelievably disembodied world because here was I, a white Zimbabwean Rhodesian, born of Central European parents in a British colony. And I could absolutely make no sense of it because everything around me just wasn't real. I mean, the white people were living in their own planet, which was totally disconnected from the African soil. The Africans who were part of the soil were invisible. I mean, they were physically visible, but psychologically and spiritually, we were completely disconnected from them. And alongside of such was this other disconnect within myself, which is that my parents were Central European and I lived in a British colony and supposedly I was part of the West but I didn't see my parents as Western. They were actually something else. Overlaid against this kind of incongruity and distance between the different worlds was at a, at a level of, if you like, functionality that all my leanings were in their psychological, spiritual direction as a very reflective young man. While I was pushed by my family continually into the economic arena. Retrospectively, I'm very thankful for that, which I'll come back to, because my desire would have been to move into psychology, development, spirituality. I was pushed into finance, accounting, economics, 
And it's the confluence of the two, which in a sense has been the life's task with which I'm engaged. Now, what then of this four wills? Well, remember that I lived ostensibly in the South, but actually in the West, because the whole programming and political conditioning was Western in the stereotypical sense of Western. At the same time, in a sense, I had inside of me this craving for the East. The first philosophical work I read in my 20s was about Indian philosophy. While at the same time, of course, I went to London School of Economics and Harvard and very much in that business economic world, which family pressures actually led me into. So I had this one con contradiction between myself, psychological, spiritual versus economic material. And then whereas there was this person who yearned for his origins in the South and yet was continually disconnected by it. So by the time I was in my 20s, I was in this crazed state where I just couldn't make sense of my world. Um, and what sticks out in my mind was really coming towards my 30s. By that stage, I was already had been running the family business, had been to Harvard London School of Economics, was a so-called economist and businessman in my own right, and was yearning to find who I really was. And at that stage, I began really to touch base with the South. And this was already in my late 30s, it was quite a late time to do this. And I, I remember very vividly being called to Zimbabwe, which had then thus become Zimbabwe, had been Rhodesia, then became independent, then independent Zimbabwe. I was called back to actually my homeland. And I remember sitting down with a man who was a gold miner and he actually mine gold spiritually because through the spirits he discovered the gold in his land <laughs> and this really excited me and i wrote this up in the book it was called global management principles the same book anika where i wrote up real management the global management principles i went to the south through this gold miner the spiritual gold miner and as i wrote up the case and showed it to him he said ronnie lessam you're not going to steal my soul <laughs> that was a very powerful moment for me that I realized that I can't just write about these things, that I have to live them, I have to be them. Around a similar time, a year or so after, I was sitting down with Lovemore and Biggie, who is in a sense my southern spiritual mentor, a very deep soul from the south, and Albert Koopman, who to my mind is still the only person to this day and age who has actually created a business which is rooted in the south. I mean a significant business. This was a worker cooperative. This was a truly Southern entity building on the divine will of Africa. And I sat down with him and I said, where, oh, where is the South? You can look East and you can find spirituality. At that time, it was the flower children. You can look West and Merrick was blooming. You can look North where my parents came from. And incidentally, the Northern Europe is so, so different from the American West that we group them together as the West to our, as, 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 as a total travesty. Um, but I look south and what do I find? Philosophically, enormous riches. Spiritually, enormous riches. Economically, nothing, zero, zilch. <laughs> and that takes us to the coronavirus. I mean, to me, the significance mm. of what we see around us, because remember, I'm prejudiced, because my longing, my yearning is to give voice to the south is that that southern voice is so, so deeply buried that here we are immersed between, if you like, the mess that China has created for us, not only just through the virus, but in a sense economically, because it's become more Western than Western. And then we have this European North, which is overcome by it, so we're suffering lockdown. And then we say, what on earth is going to happen to Africa? Nobody knows. So we're back in the same kind of boat. So. The whole passion and desire over 40, 50 years that I've pursued is, okay, we can look east, and there are these glimmers of light from the east, not enough of them, Anika. You mm -hmm. can look north, and sure, and philosophically and intellectually, Europe has been a tar pahas, but economically, it's floundering. The west, you know, Mark, that I've always seen the west in terms of the American Indian west, you know? Mm -hmm feeding into South America. And what we call the West, which is Silicon Valley, is basically the <laughs> Northwest. The North has colonized the West 
and the north has disappeared in the process. <laughs> and we're left with this image of a northwest and the west is eclipsed, except you bring it back to life for me from time to time when we engage. So you have this west, you have this north, you have this east, you have this missing self. So the one other thing before we kind of pause and reflect is where do we go with this missing self? And that is where the four worlds, each of which have their contribution to the world, ironically, despite the displacement of the self, the self cannot be actualized without the east, the north, and the west. And this is the profound paradox where if we discuss at a later point, what we call the gene. Yes, we need to ground ourselves in the south, but if we merely ground ourselves in the south, whether it's with the American Indian or the, 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 um, the Native American or the African and leave it there, we're sunk. We're back in the same boat. <laughs> we remain in a sense diminished. And so how on earth do you actually coalesce those four elements, co-evolve them while rooting ourselves in the South? And of course, end of this part of the story, for that we need an institution. And that is the life's cause which has brought us together. And here we are now that this kind of force, this dynamic, these four worlds, this integral integrality needs, needs to be institutionalized or else it's going to flounder. End wow. Part of the story. <laughs> so I'm, I'm captured, Ronnie, by the, the paintings behind you, which I think reflect the mess we're in. <laughs> the beautiful diversity of color and, and and you know one of the themes we've talked about uh, and thank you for bringing up the south and you know i i'm a german immigrant son i don't know anything about native americans other than i have a heart for them as as you have a heart for africa for for the south and i i wonder i mean and we've explored with our different guests so far um that what we're talking about is finding a, a path forward of unity, of balance, of harmony, uh, of the four worlds, of the medicine wheel, the four as aspects of the human being that we've seemed to have forgotten. We're asleep. And I've been raising this little book. I know it'll take you about two minutes to review it because you can review, you know, Piketty's book in like two mm -hmm. hours. <laughs> but this book by Peter uh, Kingsley says it's called The Story Waiting to Pierce You. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about Pythagoras and uh, Kingsley, a Brit, uh, learns Greek and he studies this man's, uh, he reads Pythagoras's diaries. And Pythagoras talks about, of course, the great Greek who brought us mathematics and, you know, and uh, sacred geometry, if you like, uh, says in every civilization, every civilization begins with an ecstasy, like an out of your mind, which is ext ecstasami. Uh, and he says, and for Pythagoras, it came in the form of a Mongolian man, from probably an indigenous man from the east, from Mongolia, to come to Greece to infect Pythagoras with this out of his mind thinking, which of course we know the Greeks have influenced the West for, and the Romans for many, for a long time in mathematics and et cetera. So this is the question I think we're talking about is what is this new story that's waiting to maybe it's an old story mm. you know mm. working with indigenous people they have this old story they say one day we will crawl back to that that tree of life but we we have forgotten we are being drunk on materialism and secularism and all the other isms that have uh, seduced us into forgetting who we really are and i think that's kind of the spirit of what we're talking about which seems fluffy and esoteric perhaps but then we try to bring it down to the pragmatic. What shall we do? What shall we do in the accounting world? Why is the accounting world the way it is? And you've written, you know, in 1974, I think you wrote that amazing paper. Uh, you know, so we, we have that common thread about the, the accounting systems can change. They can be more four worlds perspective. Um, and I know I'm, I'm going on and on, but I think that's kind of the spirit of our conversation is, it is as messy as some of the paintings behind you, and yet it's as simple as, you know, the unity of those four directions and four worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and so what blocks us, I know you're a brilliant mind. You can, I've never seen anyone summarize a book so quickly. Uh, so thank you for your life work because our children will be grateful. It's like, I know Ronnie reviewed Piketty's book in like 10 pages, you know. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Anika will tell you the irony of that. I won't go into that. <laughs> but that can have its downsides as well. Um, I think the image, the powerful image you brought, Mark, of, of um, Pythagoras and, and the Mongolian, and that confluence between those worlds, and we know in terms of individual creativity that that's always the case. It always blossoms when different worlds come together. The problem is that at an institutional level, this hasn't been mirrored and evolved, right? It may or may not be the case, but we are much less familiar of what is the institutional equivalent of what you're talking about. So, for example, if we take, um, bearing in mind um, Anika with us, you know, if we take the brilliant work that Anika has come up with, to my mind, it's absolutely vital that she can continue to co-engage with Ahua tribe. Because mm -hmm. if you just have the philosophy, Anika's philosophy, which is brilliant in its own right, mm -hmm. but then that needs to be <laughs> fused together with Ahuat as an institution. And then, and this is the really tough one. I mean, the first one is tough in its own case, as Anika knows. Then how do we actually co-engage between what's happening with Ahuat in Pakistan and what's happening with our colleagues in, in, in Saiza in Nigeria? Right? Okay. In the sense, they're in a similar world, but they're in totally different worlds, and those worlds don't come together. And if they don't come together, we don't co-create in that one. Then if we just stay with that one field, which is kind of taking us into finance and economics, we have the work that your good friend and ours, Robert, is engaged with, right? On impact finance. And in terms of weight, practically speaking, it's absolutely huge. Intellectually, as I keep discussing with, with Robert, it's like in the Stone Age. I mean, the Stone Age in a negative sense. Yeah, the Stone yes. Age has its positive, as we've been <laughs> You know, it really hasn't been evolved, and there's no institution which actually... So, you know, to come to your question, it's how do we create this kind of individual stroke institutional co-engagement? Because you still need the individuals. The individuals cast a unique original light on these matters, as, as um, Anika has done, as you have done in your own context. And then you need the institutions which you are aligned with. And then, in a sense, there needs to be these interconnected institutions. You know, as an aside, because, as you know, I'm so passionate about research academies. Yeah? It sounds a very... Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. you know, what's great about a research academy. <laughs> I mean, the total paradox, if you, if you want a research academy, in a sense, which has weight, you go to Harvard, you go to Stanford, you, know, you go to the Ivy League, you go to Oxford, and then you say to yourself, this is a horror story. This is the paradox. <laughs> you know? But its form is beautiful, right? Its monolithic nature is awful, right? But we haven't co-created something which is and it isn't. So it is a yeah. true fusion of these, you know, back to the Mongolian with, with Pythagoras. And that fusion then becomes institutionalized. And that institutionalization creates the kind of economy that doesn't exist in the world. Can, can you speak to, um, I know you've coined the word uh, community, and Dr. John Cobb just spoke similar things mm. that, as you did. We, our institutions, uh, Satish Kumar said, in, uh, in front of bankers with me on the stage in The Hague, we're graduating halfwits from the London School of Economics, right? Halfwits saying, you've missed the other oikos, uh, oikos uh, logia, the ecological. Uh, there's economic, and then there's ecological. So we're, we're graduating halfwits. So can you describe your vision for the community, which if I understand would be where we sit at the foot of our, our teachers, our mentors. We, you know, as John <coughs> Hilbury is, taught us he learned by osmosis he's completely uneducated and yet in the in the classical sense and yet he's wise um, so what what does this community university vision i think uh, promise or hold for the future of academia do you, do you feel yeah so i mean trying to link this community university vision with you know what you mentioned about john hilbury and you know where's the place for all of us that you know, the opening statement, which is authentic to the term community, that's why I sometimes get impatient with people say, oh, there's <laughs> lots of universities. And I say, well, what kind of community is it? Because the baseline, the starting point of the community is the community. And the community doesn't mean that lots of individual students doing their degrees go out into the communities and learn what's going on. I mean, that's fair enough, but that's not what we're talking about. We are saying, mm -hmm. how do communities learn? over centuries, over millennia, right? 
communities have learned. The Africans were not ignorant, right? <laughs> For thousands of years, communities, people had got together and evolved various crafts, various guilds, various political systems, right? Those had evolved. What's that about? And how do we reproduce that and evolve that in the here and now? So the starting point is whatever, 10,000 people in a rural community in Zimbabwe. That's where the community starts. Mm -hmm. And that's not an impossible dream because as I think you know from our Chinika case, which we've written up ad infinitum, ultimately 300,000 people, that was basically the base of the community. Unfortunately, that story didn't evolve itself into a community. However, where do the John Hilburys come in? You still need those enlightened spirits, those sorts of people in a sense who have the gift to reach deeply into the cultural soils and evoke some new idea, new concept out of it. So what we call the transformation journey, sometimes we call it the pilgrimium, Incre increasingly we're calling it the transformation journey is we need those journey men and women who then not only enter into that community, but engage if not in a lifelong, at least in a three, four, five year task to try and evoke what is happening in that community above and beyond the sort of immediate learning that's already going on and try and connect it with other developments in the world. This is where the integral worlds truly comes in that they connect in this case with the South or the East but they also interconnect with other parts of the world, learn from that. So that's that transformation journey. However, and you know, at each point we reach the limits. It's a bit like the dialectic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the community reaches its limits. You can only go so far. The individuals kind of take it on, but the big fault line, and this Mark and Anika, as you know, is a great, great passion of mine as a Southerner, is the massive, massive limitation of individual education. And it's massively limited on two counts. The so one is it breeds an elite, which you were talking about, to then bypass where they come from. But the second thing is I, as an individual, am powerless. I mean, how much can I achieve as an individual? I need a group of people around you. So unless in a sense that individual <laughs> learning, that transformation journey born out of the local soil, but connected with the wide worlds is coalesced into some kind of intellectual entity, which we call the research academy, it ultimately gets lost. We see that again and again with our individual students. They go so far and then the whole thing dissipates. So you need that and bear in mind that research academy uniquely needs to reach into the local soils and reach out to the world. I mean, how many do we have of those in the world? Well, we need to give rise to that. So those are the first three elements. And then, and this is my business background like yours and Anika, you need your laboratories. I mean, these things need to be tested out. They need to be worked through. There needs to be an interaction with what's happening in the practical world of economy and polity and civil, civil society and what's happening in the rest. Now, this sounds obvious. And of course, you have anodyne versions like you have your triple helix. Right? So, you know, university interacts with government. And of course, in high tech, the interaction between laboratory and academy is supreme. But one, we're not dealing with high tech. We're dealing with social, cultural issues. And there the interaction is very weak. So all of these elements need to actually come together so that just to sort of conclude this one, what's happening at the moment in Zimbabwe is very much born out of the kinds of new enterprises which are being created in rural communities and in the urban sector. At the same time, rubbing shoulders with hundreds of thousands of people living in communities. At the same time, in a sense, reaching for the kind of intellectual entity which will express and articulate for the wider world what's coming out of that. And well, in a way it's obvious, it's kind of common sense, and yet where do we have these kinds of configurations? Can I come in now? Yeah, please. Please, we need a <laughs> female voice, please. <laughs> so Ronnie, considering that uh, Mark has just said, that a new story is waiting to pierce mm. our soul or mm. our world soul. And as you are very closely working nowadays with uh, a university in Zimbabwe, so can we now say that the story can come out of the South, as you say, the global South? Is there a chance for that? Or what do you think about this? Well, profoundly. Um... 
Of course, in terms of my personal life story, this is obviously the time to reconnect very strongly with my roots. In terms of the world story, I think two things. The one is the South is sufficiently, in a sense, unprocessed right, mm -hmm. to be ripe for evolution. There's a third element which is particular to Zimbabwe is that Zimbabwe has always struck me as having a unique kind of uh, connection between the North and the South. You know, you have a lot of the Southern communal nature, that kind of passion, but a lot of engineers, quite well-developed technology, this kind of thing. Amongst the Black Africans, I'm not, you know, in South Africa, it's, it's more on the white side. So there is that kind of ripeness. Um, over and above that, of course, the very fact that we have somebody on our PhD program, and you know, the whole idea, Nico, of the program is to give birth to these kinds of things, that we have probably the most developed configuration of people that we have in our different parts of the world in Zimbabwe. One working very actively with rural communities, Dad Talanika together with his wife. The other, probably the most evolved, significant African enterprise in the urban environment, Providence Human Capital. And this new Dean of Student Services at this new university in the beautiful mountain area of Zimbabwe, just surrounded by nature in the most incredible way. So in that awesome. sense, yeah, we are very ripe for this kind of um, yeah. Ev evolution. Yeah, um, I would have to say for us, and I'm saying this as a almost an invitation for all of us to participate, the toughest one by far is the research academy. I mean, that, that is the one mm. that's on, very much on the agenda. But the one plus, of course, is that in Zimbabwe, they have something called, it's rather um, simplistic, called 5.0, which is the idea that universities should carry five elements. They should have teaching, they should have research, they should have community service, but they should also have what they call industrialization, which can also be agricultural and innovation built into it. So there's something in the kind of governmental soils in Zimbabwe, which is also looking for this kind of thing. Hmm. So when we come to, so when you say research, and now we're talking about the global south, and then I know you're working extensively on the Africology as well. I mean, I see that as limiting as well. We either have the Western research and those paradigms and then there's the southern as well and that's very limiting as well it's like they're still not integrating and to me i feel like i i feel at loss i don't want to say it but either we become colonized or decolonized so is there a mid midway here <laughs> we can meet well yeah i think there is i mean bear in mind anika that africology as distinct from afrocentricity you know afrocentricity is about discovering the africanness in us africology is different it's saying that we are rooted as humankind in africa but in a sense we then evolved around the whole of the world or what we could call worlds so africology is about all of the worlds but with the rooting in africa that's that's the first thing so it, in that sense, it's not as parochial. But the second thing, which is absolutely vital, and, and I look to you and Mark to help is, when you begin actually working with the dynamics of Afroecology in relation to economy, you immediately see that the Eastern element is kind of inhibited vis-a-vis -vis the Southern one. So I then look to the likes of you and say, okay, you know, we might call this ISRA or solidarity economics, but Africology needs its own version of solidarity economics. It's not just economics. It needs so, and Mark needs its own version of well-being economics. The Thank only you, yeah. difference being in my latest kind of um, abbreviation of, of um, ASIRET, as I call it, that used to be Africological Center for Integral Research and Economic Transformation. I now call it not integral, but Imveyan. Imveyan comes from Imveo in Zulu, which means cosmic order, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm immediately switching the context into the South mm -hmm. because integral is not Southern. <laughs> However, in that context, the well being economics, which is a kind of marriage of South and West in my eyes, is desperately needed. 
Solidarity economics is desperately needed. It only needs to be kind of flexed in that southern direction. So uh -huh. to take your point, Anika, absolutely, it can't be exclusive. Otherwise, it's going to be undeveloped. <laughs> it needs okay. to be fused with the other worlds. Can I, can I ask you, um, Ronnie, I mean, I think oftentimes I hear, I hear enormous frustration in your voice. Um, uh -huh. and, and, and because we were born into this Western mind, a system of accounting and economics that we, we took for being self-evident, and it, we've learned that it's not self-evident. It's something we created out of our imagination. Mm -hmm. And we maintain a system that is clearly unjust, uh, is not in harmony with nature, violates natural laws, uh, on and on and on. And, you know, I think, you know, with the efforts that I'm trying to do, I'm, you know, what I, what I learned is that the language we use, and you, you're, you're a scholar of language. I mean, the, the reason I use well-being, because it comes from the old English, means the conditions of well-being, even if Adam Smith didn't find it that way in the wealth of nations. So we have this kind of, we're under a spell kind of in a sense that the language still is speaking truth. And uh, Anika, are you chatting or am I chatting? <laughs> I'm sending you a message. <laughs> Continue, please. Thank you. You could interrupt me, um, but the question is, and I, what I what gives me hope is we we actually see these innovations at the margin of the matrix, let's call it a system that's dominated because of ignorance, right? I mean, you know, my life's my life study has been the money system. How is it that we we're not taught about the money system in business schools as business people as economists? You know, the snake around the stick on the demand supply curve. Like no one ever asked, where does that come from? And and yet, when we discover the truth of those things, we realize, like the Wizard of Oz, he has no clothes. He's like, a, you know, some a few people maybe in London who who persist, you know, in this the domination of a system that is really an enslaved a slave system. And and yet, so we have, but we have innovations like Sekum. We have, you know, the the beautiful and and the the well-being theme. I think does resonate with a lot of people. But the question is, why, why do we continue to see the resistance, the barriers, as if that system has an incredibly strong immune system to innovation, to wisdom? Um, and, and it's maybe a rhetorical question um, that, whose answer is self-evident. But this is what I'm looking at right now in the world. I said, right now in this moment, we could, we could uh, for Canada, for example, we could say the central bank will become now the sovereign bank. What is Mark Carney talking about? He's talking about some other esoteric thing that we're going to have a Facebook Libra like currency. No, this is absolutely the wrong way to go. And yet he will appear as the solution to the global pandemic. And we're saying no, that solution in my mind is local ecologically based economies and financial systems. That means that the, we have enormous diversity now. We don't have a homogeneity and a monoculture which is the, is the root, we're almost like in a path, in, in a split in the road here. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do we act in, in terms of celebrating those innovations, which ecology teaches us is a hallmark of resilience. Yeah, and I, I guess the, the, or did you want to um, add Anika? No, 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 you continue, please. I'm going to read her chat yeah. as, as you respond. <laughs> so, so on your question, um, Mark, I guess there's a kind of micro dimension, the macro dimension, the macro dimension, which strikes me in particular because of my passion for the South, but frankly, 10 years ago, it could have been equally for the East, is at a philosophical level, at a philosophical intellectual level, they're amazing breakthroughs. I mean, there's so many great African philosophers today, admittedly, a lot of them from West Africa, particularly Nigeria, but phenomenal. I mean, if you really look around, you'll see it. Um, and so in that sense, there is a breakthrough. I mean, decolonialism is a big thing at the moment. And, and you just see Sabella Blavogaceni, our friend, on the Facebook, if you have a look. The tone of what he's saying is so different from what people with a more Eastern Northern outlook have. So at that level, yes, there's been big breakthroughs. But translate it into the political economic arena, <laughs> the practical arena. That's where your point is, is so true that, you know, how do we take it from there and get it there? 
And at a personal level, which I go to next, every time I then reach out to one of these great philosophers, uh, you know, then you have kind of what's in it for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, join hands and let's transform the economic system. And I need your wisdom. Now, having said that, where there's sign for hope in a sense, but again, maybe paradoxical, if you see, for example, in Zimbabwe, if you take the university, which is a practical realization at a, a university level of what we're talking about, great excitement amongst government ministers. You know, our people there at the whatever, knock of a door, ring of a bell, they can get to one of these government ministers. I couldn't do that in the UK, right? Mm. Um, but there they can do it. Um, the issue then there is to, to be more Northwestern about it, to, to develop a coherent program and process together, not rushing off here and rushing off there. So if you like, that's the, 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 the Exciting element is that there are these seeds of hope on both counts. Philosophically, okay. intellectually, there is a breakthrough from other parts of the world. Practically, in the more marginalized areas, you can quickly get to the powers that be. But in between, <laughs> we need to have a purposeful way through. Right, so I'm sort of infamously bringing it back to the practical questions. <laughs> I get told by Mark and John. <laughs> so considering that we are talking about this COVID-19 crisis situation mm -hmm. and whatever you have very brilliant, brilliantly related to the, you know, the, the divide between East, West and South, how do we then reconcile, say for example, if we look at the South or East, Whereas the West is so busy at the moment looking for finding vaccine and cure and all this, I look towards the East where I'm coming from, they're all content and you know, we are very spiritual, God will heal us and all this and you look at the <laughs> South and uh, I mean, I, I, I would actually appreciate that they're saying, oh, the alternative healing, nature has the healing power so how do we switch to that and bring that back into our living, which we have forgotten? Um, so how do we reconcile in this current situation? I'm going to respond at a very personal, direct level. I, mean, <laughs> because I have to say, I find this interchange exciting because I'm with two very exciting people. And when you say respond, if you look at what we have in our community, as you know, I mean, certainly you know, Anika, I think you know, Mark. So we have Pax Herbals in Nigeria. I mean, they're mm -hmm, in the heart mm -hmm. of the matter from what you're talking about, actually working on a potential cure, but it's more than that. They are so deeply ensconced in nature and bringing nature to humanity and healing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit marginal at the moment, but you know, we have the biggest medical laboratories in the Middle East med labs, right, who are actually in the thick mm. of it, they're doing all the testing and so on. And then we have Providence Human Capital. And remember the background to what you're saying is what the virus is telling us that without, without our nature and without our human health and well-being, you can have the greatest kind of economy in the world, but we're dead, right? So it's reminding mm. us of you know, where we're originally coming from. Here, uh, Providence Human Capital, as of yesterday, has virtually taken over the whole program in Zimbabwe of, of, of how you deal with the virus, right? There are right. In, so what I'm saying is amidst us, we have these very significantly formative forces. Um, but, and this is where my direct comment, we haven't yet been able to rise to the occasion where we can say to ourselves and to the world, between us, we have a means of resolution. I mean, and then, you know, if you go over to the whole financial side of things, Mark, you're in the, in the thick of things as well as Robert and so on. <laughs> so we really do have massive formative forces amongst us, but it's how we get our act together together at, yes, at this time. I mean, what couldn't be a better time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if this conversation could lead to that next evolution, Sure, um, sure. And we are inviting Father Anstal on Saturday to talk oh, about this. Yeah. yeah, so sort of, you know, building that string, that chain. 
yeah. to see if something can come out of this. I, I mean, this is why Mark and I created this platform or this space that we can all, it's not about us talking, it's about all of us now coming together and saying, okay, we have these potentials within amongst ourselves. How do we join hands? Because otherwise we are all working still in our silos, in our countries, in our regions. Um, so let's yeah. see if we can succeed. Well, and that, go somewhere. Is, as you know, Nika, my absolute music to my ears. Right? Thank you. Yeah. I knew. Fantastic that you're doing this. And, and Thank, you. No. Thank you. Thank okay. you for today.